Hello, and welcome to the Physical Therapy Owners Club podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Shields. And today I've got Eric Miller of Econologics on again to talk about <laughs> money. People are getting tired of seeing us, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Personally, I love having you on because I love talking about money and talking yeah. about business with you. Um, and you've always got some awesome stuff to share. But Eric, if I didn't mention, is with Econologics financial advisor and works specifically with uh, private practice owners through many different industries, not just physical therapy, but also veterinary, dental, et cetera. And, um, and, to, and I got turned on to what you're talking about today from a video by Christopher Music mm -hmm. and his conversation about how the household is the head of your organization. Um, yeah. I want to get into that a little bit because we want to talk about household KPIs, and then a little bit as I teased on the Facebook group um, about how to protect some of your business assets, and also if you're selling, how to avoid capital gains. And also recently, we're you know hearing a lot about possible inflation, or or actually in the middle of inflation happening. Yeah. So before we get into all that, tell us a little bit about your thoughts regarding the household and the head of your organization and certain KPIs that we need to really watch. Yeah, I mean, the concept of, uh, I mean, you look at, okay, just take any, any, any nation, right? I mean, it is, it, it really is the, the household is the building block of any civilization, right? Mm -hmm. Mother, father, parent, you know, it's just, it is a building block of a civilization. So um, the, the, con the financial condition of any nation really is just this, is the sum total of all the conditions of the households in that country, right? And because every, every piece of land, I mean, aside from that stuff that's owned by the government, of course, which of course is becoming a bigger problem because they're owning more assets than people are, right? Uh, but any, you know, companies, corporations, bank accounts, uh, real estate, all of that is owned by individuals. Now it may be owned in, in limited liability corporations or trusts or anything like that, but those are owned by individuals. You see, so the reason that we're we're so bent on like really making sure that practice owners look at their household as like this as like the parent company, because in corporate America, you've, you've heard that there's big organizations, they have parent companies and then they own assets or businesses and all of those assets then feed for the benefit of whatever the goals and purposes are of that parent company. Mm -hmm. And we just took that concept and said that really is when you look at it, the, the household is the parent company, because as a practice owner, you know, you own the business, right? But the business is there to provide for the benefit of the household. And mm -hmm. this is my, this is my constant battle with a lot of private practice, physical therapists, uh, owners, is that they're, they're not looking at that from that perspective. And what that does is that they they neglect to pay the, the household what they should from the business, right? They don't, mm -hmm. they don't adequate, adequately compensate themselves as, as the owner of the parent company. And that's where, you know, we really try to make sure that they're incorporating that in as an expense every single week, right? You got to pay the parent company. You got to pay the parent company. And even some of these, you know, private equity groups out there, I mean, they, they charge a management fee for yeah. managing all these practices, right? You can look at it the same way, like your, your parent company, you know, has goals and purposes. You want to have multiple income sources. You want to get out of debt. You want to have a vacation home. You want to pay for your kid's college. You want to do all these things from the household level, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you got to make sure that the business is compensating you correctly to do that. And, you know, a lot of PTs pay themselves like a W-2 wage yeah. for like a practitioner role. And you may take out distributions over and above that just to kind of pay for your lifestyle. But mm. very few are actually compensating their owner hat. Mm. And that's where, you know, as we've talked about many a times is, is really incorporating that 10% of the yeah. practice revenue. That's yeah. your owner compensation. That is right. there to, you know, it's not there to buy a boat. It's there for you to expand your household, the parent yeah. company. It's yeah. there to insulate it, to protect it, 
to create other income sources that that's really what that is for and yeah. that's the big again you know talking you talk you talk to a lot of pts just like i do it's like you know they're they get to that point of burnout and i'm like well it's you're not you're not burnt out you're you're just not competent you're not the business isn't in exchange with you as it should be exactly you gotta change that yeah and it's it's interesting because i i guess i never even thought about it period where my household stood in relationship to my business but if you were to ask me and pin me down i, I would say well yeah the business is up here and the household yeah. serves the business you know my wife um takes care of things at home we're lucky enough to have that situation so that i can go work at the business and thus i think the business stands above the household where that whole thought process uh, upon learning it just switched my thinking and the mentality that no the business is set up and was set up by me and i lost this somewhere because maybe because i didn't codify it like you're talking about but the business is set up to serve my family it's to serve yes. me and my family and my future my kids future that's the reason i set it up in the first place so setting it atop of the org chart if you will that that business serves the household and needs to flow money to it in order for the family to fulfill its purposes and its goals uh, was That's new it. and novel to me. And I think that it could be new and novel to many other owners if they don't have that mentality. Yeah. And I, I think it really does it. I don't know. It just puts, it makes you look at your business a little differently. It makes you want to mm -hmm. structure it so that it can run autonom autonomously to a yeah. degree. Yeah. I mean, you're always, if you own it, you're always going to have some attention, you know, that you have to pay to it. Sure. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you should want to set it up so that, you know, you can just manage from above and, mm -hmm. you know, have it still, you know, provide you a uh, compensation. Yeah, and for sure. I, I just, I've just heard so many practice owners think that the sale of their business is, is where they're going to create their wealth. You know, like they just, they just wreck, they, they just, I'm going to put all my, I'm never going to pull any money out of the business. I'm going to put everything back into it. And the, the value of the business is going to be my quote unquote retirement. I'm like, well, why can't you have it both ways? Yeah. Why can't you build a very valuable practice? And at the same time, have it, you know, pay the household so that you can create other income sources. So you're not dependent mm -hmm. upon it forever. I think you yeah. A clinic, both. a clinic that's valuable and gets more uh, in the sale is one that is generating cash flow in abundance. Yeah. And in that case, it would be generating cash flow for your family and your household in abundance. Uh, that's what provides the value to a potential buyer. Yeah, correct. Right? Cool. Correct. Well, it, so in that case, um, you have some KPIs yeah. for the household that uh, you, you wanted to share with us because we have KPIs in our business and we should, if you don't talk to me, I'll share with you some KPIs that you should be tracking in your business on a weekly basis. Uh, but I was intrigued, but, you, but because you mentioned, you know, some possible topics we could talk about are KPIs for the household. So yeah, I want to hear those. Yeah. Well, I think it comes as a financial advisor, you know, and I tell people that I think the, the first thing that they automatically just assume is that I, I'm, I manage portfolios. Right, which is like I just manage a stock and bond port. I think that's what most people's experience have been with advisors in general. Yeah, right? exactly. They manage yeah. they manage my IRA or my four hundred one k and and usually and, not well. And, and you, said, <laughs> <laughs> you said that I didn't. Uh, but my uh, experience, yeah. my experience is, uh, yeah, my financial advisors in the past have not done a good job. They just, you know, but that's where they spend their attention and time on, and right. you know. There's nothing wrong with that. I just think that when you really look at, uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna manage a household, if you're gonna be an advisor for a practice owner, number one, you got to understand their biggest investment, which is their business, right? You got to understand how it works and how to set up systems for money to to channel to the household. If you don't know that, right, you're almost negligent as far as I'm concerned, because there's hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you have a million or two million dollar practice and it's not being used correctly, there's literally hundreds of thousands of dollars that are being lost every single year. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, but from the household level, you know, I, I try to direct people because there's so much noise out there, right? About 
where Bitcoin, you know, cryptocurrencies, um, where to where to put my money in case there's a crash. I mean, people have their attention just spread all over the place. Right. And I'm like, well, if you just had some key performance indicators for for your household, financial mm-hmm. indicators, right? These are the things that are important, right? Mm-hmm. And regardless of what's happening out there, if you really focus on these things, then you know you're going to be okay. All right. Yeah. So I think the first thing, uh, the first key performance indicator is what we'll just call uh, your business growth rate. Hmm. So I say that because again, you know, most practice owners, your big, your, your, your practice is your biggest, inv- your, your practice is your household's biggest investment. Yes. Right. So you want that thing to grow mm-hmm. at, at a, at a certain rate. Now I would say minimally, minimally, you should see a 25% growth rate over a three-year period, okay, not okay. one year, okay. over a three-year period, okay? Now, you ask me where I came up with that number. Um, I forgot exactly how we came up with that, but <laughs> it sounded pretty good. It sounds good uh, to me. Uh, but, it's, but, what here, but why is that important? Because it shows that your practice, because everyone's worried about like my investments, my 401ks, what kind of rate of return are they earning? But what about your business growth rate, right? Mm. Are you tracking that? Because that really is, it, you know, that's where you'll see your net worth increase by a lot. Well, it, any it, purchasers want to see that too. Oh they my gosh. See, yeah, yeah. They want to see you sold- your, over your growth. Would it be, it, it, I, it's just kind of budgeting out a 10% growth rate annually? Pretty Good close practice. to that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You can yeah, do the same. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, a exactly. 10% growth. If you want to do it that way, that's fine. I mean, it's, okay. it just shows that there is. There is a there is a growth rate occurring in that practice, so that that if I'm looking at that from a buyer perspective, mm-hmm. um, this thing isn't dying; it's yeah. growing, it's expanding, yeah. right? Exactly. So there must be some attention to the marketing and promotion and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But as a, from a household perspective, you should you should be looking at that. Like, what has my business growth rate been over the last three years? And if it's sideways, oh, okay. that's that's no bueno. Right. Because that means that the business is only going sideways and the value is only going sideways. So your personal net worth is going to go up as your growth rate of your business goes up. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so that would be what I would call a, a, one of the KPIs. So um, you, you would measure it not necessarily as a business growth rate, but you would measure maybe your personal net worth as something that is in, increasing 25% over three years. Well, I, we do have the, the, the 25% business growth rate is, is a KPI, but you know, certainly if it's, if it's doing that, then I would assume that the business value is increasing as well. Sure. Like if, if the growth, when I talk about growth rate, I guess I'm just talking about revenue, revenue, revenue of the business over over that period of time. So, um, but anyway, that's, that's, that's one indicator that we would look at um Mm -hmm. you know obviously another one would be are you are you doing your seven to ten percent into um as as your owner compensation so you know we you know we talked a lot about that you know what that's a key performance indicator uh are you taking uh, you know i say seven to ten percent because i know it's not real for Mm -hmm. a lot of people to do ten percent right off the bat sure but you know, if you're in that range of seven to ten percent. So again, if you have a million dollar practice, are you taking seventy to a hundred thousand dollars a year and channeling that to the household to create other income sources outside right. of the business? Right. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a key performance indicator. And I'll I would be frank with you, that's probably one of the most important. Yeah. Because if you can get that in place consistently over a seven to ten year period, you really shouldn't have any problems with money ever right. again. Right. So that would be one Mm -hmm. Um, being on track to be personally debt free in five to seven years. So what do I mean by that? So there that would be a key performance indicator. Am I on track to be personally debt free? When I say personally debt free, I'm not talking about like your real estate debt. I'm not talking about I'm just talking about like your house, credit cards, automobiles, anything that's that I would consider bad debt. I'd want to have that paid off in a five to seven year period. Right. And that including your house, including your house. Yeah. Including your house. And I know that there's people go back and forth on that just because they do, but I've never met, I've certainly never met any, um, uh, I've never met a spouse that was unhappy because their house was paid off. Right. Right. I've never never met one. Uh, and, And I've said this before. There's, there is a, a mathematical argument 
to not paying your house house off. I, I, I can, you can make that argument because sure. of low interest rates and, and that. Yeah. But like I said, I've never seen anybody in a bad financial condition because they had their house paid off. Right. Never. You know, the, the, uh, the opportunities actually expand if it is. Paid they do because you feel secure now. And, and you, now this is the place where you have all your pleasure moments, right? I mean, you got, you know, how many kids you got, Nate, you got like seven, seven, seven eight, seven kids, right? <laughs> it's seven. like, how many, how many pleasure moments do you have at your house? All the time. It's, it's like where you go to like, you know, decompress. And right. um, I, I think you should own that outright. Yeah. I really do. Hard to so decompress with seven kids, but That's I know true. what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, another one would be your, your household income. Mm -hmm. All right. So I, I dare say that you should minimally have a target of making over $300,000, especially if you own a practice of making over $300,000 a year of personal mm -hmm. income. Because when you take into account taxes and, you know, kids' costs and food and uh, trying to build uh, wealth in other places, if you're trying to do that and making $120,000 a year, it just ain't going to work. It's hard. You know, it's, it's super hard. So you have to have a bigger target. And that, and I think right. $300,000 is a good, okay, in, in excess of that would mean that you're making enough money. To, to be able to do all the things that you want to do in life. And, so, and put away for the future, for sure. And, and put away for the future. Yeah, exactly. So if your target is under that, it's going to be really hard to do all three of those things. When I say mm -hmm. pay for your lifestyle, put money away to create other income sources and have discretionary income. Yeah. So those are the three categories. And the, you know, minimally, I think you need at least 300,000 to be able to do those effectively. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and everyone's different. I get that. And they live in different areas and they have, but I think that would be the minimum. And then, uh, but obviously more would be better. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll give you two more. Your effective cool. tax rate would be a key performance indicator. Huh. So your effective tax rate is, is simply the amount of total tax that you pay compared to your income that you make. Sure. So it's a key indicator because if you, it's at 40 or 50 percent, that's bad. Right. So I think it it, it should be under 30 percent. Mm. Okay. Should be under 30 percent. And now I got all the people in California and New York pissed at me right now because they're like, "Oh, it's impossible." How Eric. do we do that? <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> I'm like, well, you just need to be proactive and mm. find tax strategists out there that that can help minimize that and stop going to your accountant to try to minimize your tax bill because he yeah, doesn't care. You know, I unfortunately learned that the hard way that the CPA doesn't have the answers. No. Um, when he told me after the fact, after I sold my clinics, what uh, some ideas that I had, had been shared with me on how to avoid capital gains tax on the sale. He's like, oh yeah, you could have done that. I'm like, what? <laughs> you didn't tell me that before? Oh my God, that, <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that makes me mad. Right? That's, that's almost like, like if you would have done that to somebody as a healthcare professional yeah, and said, you could have done that, like you'd have got sued out of your pants, you know? Right. And like, that doesn't, right. uh, anyway. I yeah. Guess and so, right yeah, don't rely on your CPA. Find someone who knows uh, yeah. tax strategies. Like tax said, strategies. That, and, yeah, and that follow understand. the tax guidelines that help you avoid paying more taxes than you have to. Yeah, folks, there's 2 million words of the tax code. There is nobody that knows that thing up and down. Um, but there are people that have looked through it and, and certainly could find different strategies for you. But sure. And then I think, you know, just making sure that, you know, two quick other ones um, would be like your profit margin of your business. That I mean, it's more of a business indicator, but I'm sure you keep, you know, you'd want to keep track of that. I think it should be 20% or higher, right? Yeah. But again, at the household perspective, you would want to look at that as well. And then, um, you know, emergency uh, emergency reserves, mm -hmm. you know, and, and again, you got to look at because you have the household and I'm probably, you know, my, my viewpoints changed a little bit on this um, just because in the past, you know, people were like, oh, you only need like three months, three to six months of cash to pay for your expenses. And now I'm like, you know, maybe, maybe in that six to 12 month would be better. Oh, really? And then for the, and, and then for the business, I think you should have at least two months of business expenses 
at in, least in like a business. Yeah, at least just just because of what's been happening, and you have that factor of safety in case mm. something bad does happen where you have to get shut down or you get attacked or you get yeah. sued or Medicare comes in there and audits and says that you owe a hundred thousand dollars, you know, for whatever reason, you, mm -hmm. you got to be able to defend yourself. Pay but if you don't have re resources, <laughs> what's that? Pay the lawyers. Yeah. Pay the lawyers. You got to be able to defend yourself or you're right. going to go bankrupt. Right. So, I mean, it's okay to have money just sitting in liquid cash. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's as long as there's a purpose assigned to it. Right. And most people can't stand it. They're like, it's just money sitting there. It's losing value. And I go, that may be true, but it's there for a purpose. Right. Right. And um, that purpose is for the protection of the organizations. You know, it's been a, it was a big push of mine with my coaching clients to make sure they have lines of credit and yeah. maybe increase those, especially during the pandemic and make sure they're in place now, even though there's not a foreseeable um, event coming and they're usually unforeseeable. So make sure it's together now. Um, would you recommend the same thing as a household, even if your home is paid off to have access to a home equity line of credit? I, I, see, this is where I'm like, you know, cause people are like, well, why don't I just use the lines of credit as emergency funds, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to having the cash there. And I'm like, yeah. why don't you just do both? But I would okay. absolutely agree right. that get as much credit as you possibly can Mm -hmm. All right. If you have good credit, grab as much as you can get a home equity line of credit. Heck, if you even have a brokerage account, you can get what's called a securities back line of credit. Oh, that, really? that can, ex yeah. So you can, you know, if, if anyone you can't do this against like IRAs and 401ks, but if you oh, have okay. like non, non-qualified money in a brokerage account, um, you can from, for, I would say most of the platforms I would, uh, custodians would allow that but mm -hmm. you can get a line of credit against the money that's invested. Mm -hmm. And think about that. And right now the rates are like 2% oh, yeah. on those securities back line of credit. Wow. And if you're, if your investments are making more than that, you can borrow money for really, really cheap and use that. And just that your securities are the collateral for that. Oh, that's great. So, but okay. yeah, just grab as much credit as you possibly can because mm -hmm. you just never know. You just never mm -hmm. know. And right. you always do these things when the financial seas are calm. Yeah. So, uh, that, yeah, that would be my, I would, I would certainly do that. Get mm -hmm. as much line, you know, your business line of credit, get as much as you can. If you have a building that's paid off, get a line of credit against that. Mm -hmm. If your house is paid off, get a line of credit against that. You don't have to use it, but it's, it, no. it's sitting there. Right. You know, it's just sitting there. And if you have reserves and you have a business line of credit, then what happens is that whenever when everything really goes to pot and you have practices out there that are just trying to get rid, they're just trying to sell off at fire sales, you can swoop in there and pay cash. Right. You know. Right. So it it's a, it can be a strategy too for acquisitions as well. Mm -hmm. Great idea. And you can't do that when you got lot... five million dollars of debt. No. <laughs> 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 yeah. What is a uh... Will Humphreys, my business partner, likes to say, you know, profitability unlocks possibility. And the yep. same can be said for cash. And when you have cash on hand, the opportunities uh, just kind of open themselves up to you. They, they really do. And I think that it, there's so many opportunities that you see out there. Uh, and everyone, you hear that all the time. If I just had the money, I could have, I could have had this great opportunity. Like, right. Well, you have to be worthy of that opportunity, mm. you know, and you have mm. to put yourself in a, in, in a good financial condition. And I, I tend to find that when people are doing a lot of the right things financially and really build up themselves to, to be financially worthy, then really good opportunities present themselves. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Because they're worthy of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's just I an like interesting how you say that. phenomenon. No, I like how you say that. that you know, uh, m money attracts money, like attracts like. Yeah. And if you're going to do good things with money, then people will come to you because of that confidence. Then the universe kind of works that way towards you as well, like you it, said. It, it really does. And you're right. It is It is all about confidence. You know, I mean, if you're, people don't give people money that they don't have confidence in. Right, right. I don't, I don't think. Maybe no. they do, but it doesn't seem like <laughs> it. Well, those are some awesome KPIs. Just to review, there's business yeah. growth rate that's 25% increase over three years. Um, the 7 to 10% profit, or I'm sorry, revenue set aside 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. It goes directly to the owner compensation, the being personally debt free, at least within yeah. the next five to seven years, five to seven years. Yeah. You got to have a target, a pretty short term target on that one. Right. Yeah. Uh, get a household household income of greater than 300,000 a year. Yep. Get your effective tax rate down below 30%. Yep. Don't rely on your, well, in parentheses, don't rely on your CPA to help you with this. Um, get your profit margin in the business above 20% and yep. make sure you have a large supply of emergency reserves, keeping six months as the target. Now think about, imagine what your life would look like if all those things were in place. Right. Would, you be, would you be worried about what your friggin' mutual fund did last quarter, you know, mm -hmm. or... Would you be worried about if the price of milk went up from $2 a gallon to $4 a gallon? Right. You know, would right. you be worried about all those things? It, no. Probably not. Right. Yeah. Cause you're like, you've put yourself in a position where you don't have to worry about those things. Yeah. You know, that's, it, that's why we call them those key performances. That, that's yeah. where people's attention should be right. as opposed to all the knucklehead stuff that right. they see out there. Cool. Well, talking about that and that, that those are our household KPIs, but, what can we do with the conversation regarding inflation recently? What yeah. and we're in the middle of June, 2021 for anyone that's listening. Um, what can we do to hedge against inflation knowing or seeing what's happening? You know, I think there's a couple things that you can do. Uh, you know, obviously it's, you have to, the, the best hedge against inflation, you know, you know obviously people are going to say gold and, and silver uh, maybe cryptocurrencies. Yeah. And I, I, I'm not going to disagree. I think you should own those things as insurance almost. Sure. Right. Those are insurance mm -hmm. in case there is a currency collapse. Right. Okay. Um, which inevitably is the end result of inflation, right? It just makes mm -hmm. the money completely worthless. So that there, there is some uh, validity in that in, you know, owning, I don't know, maybe five to ten percent of your of your net worth in in those types okay. of, of those types of things. Okay. You don't have to own all like yeah, no. and commodities or something like that. You don't have sure. to own like all of your investments. Don't need to go. And I got some people that just like every money, every dollar that they make goes into buying gold and silver. I'm like, you, you don't need to do that. That's okay, a <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a it's a really a lot. So, but you know, things that produce income, I think, are your best hedge against inflation, right? Okay. Because uh, and I use this example already, you know, you, Warren Buffett doesn't care if the price of eggs goes from $4 to, to, to $10. Why? Because mm -hmm. he just owns so many mean businesses and means of production and his income is so high. He, he does, it doesn't affect him. Whereas if you're making 50 grand a year on a fixed income and those things go up, it does affect you. So it, it really, inflation really hurts people that are on like a fixed wage or a fixed right. salary right? because, because of that. All right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going back to the whole, the whole trying to create multiple income sources, I think that is probably your best hedge against inflation is just having multiple income streams, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That if you have a business that's producing, you know, uh, revenue for you, and then you have real estate and maybe mm -hmm. you have, you know, wealth, other kinds of wealth building vehicles, stocks, bonds, or insurance products, or whatever it is, right? right. That's, that's feeding you income. That, that to me is going to be your best hedge against inflation. And then of course, it, it's just, it's just investing in things that are going to pay you to own them. Right. Right. Like that's it. Right. Like you got to, those things should be whatever those things are. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then having an insurance uh, with the with the with the precious metals commodities or or you know crypto although I'm not hundred percent sold on the crypto yet but you know <laughs> my mind is changing understood understood yeah the uh, so and you would say just to make some connections here the seven to ten percent owner distribution seventy percent of rev, seven to ten percent of revenues that you recommend the owner set aside as their distribution be going yep. towards some of these wealth creation um, vehicles right should be yeah. going towards the future purchase of real estate yep into uh, uh, like you said insurance vehicle for retirement stocks bonds yep. 401ks you name it. it should be going into that stuff that's where it should be going yeah it should right. be going to things that are going to uh, either be able to produce income for you now or future income at some point in time 
-hmm. but it should be something that uh, that has those characteristics and uh, and for sure for sure Mm -hmm. and I think if you do that you know consistently over you know a seven to ten year period then you know you'll just now that that's kind of your passive income right there Mm -hmm. and then and then whenever it is that you decide to sell your business man that's just now another pile of money that you got to to invest generate and, passive income more and, passive and income. generate more passive income exactly right, right so it just uh i just think it's a real successful action to do that and mm. that that to me is probably a better way that to, to, to fight inflation than to worry about like you know buying you know 50 rolls of toilet paper right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Don't put all your money in Dogecoin, people. No, no. Kind of but I mean, you just yeah. got to be a, a bit intelligent. But, you know, certainly yeah. getting out of, uh, yeah, just owning assets that are that are going to pr- have the ability to produce something of value. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and that and that really is, the, I think, the best hedge against inflation. Now, we were talking a little bit about this in terms of asset protection, you know, having your emergency reserves. Uh, access to lines of credit. What more can you say about asset protection for our businesses? Well, you know, again, I think asset protection is, is like, um, you know, you own an asset, whatever it is. uh, And you don't want anything to be able to just come in and someone to come. I mean, you can talk about asset protection would be like prevent lawsuits. Like let's take a lawsuit. Like, I I don't know. I mean, everyone's, I guess, is is probably going to get sued at some point in their life, you know, and, you know, you just, you don't know when it's going to happen. I mean, I have, I've had clients that have had, you know, they have kids and, you know, kids on their insurance and then they get into a car wreck. And then all of a sudden, you know, who's going to get sued? Mm -hmm. You know, the parents are going to get sued. Right, right. So, you know, with asset protection, it's just trying to build some layers of, obstacles around an asset. That's it. Mm -hmm. So it makes it more difficult for a creditor to get, to be able to get a hold of the money. Okay. So you, there's some tools that you can use for that. One would be insurance, right? Right. So Mm -hmm. like liability insurance, Mm -hmm. if you have for your household, like a a personal umbrella policy would be, would be, would be something I would highly recommend. Yeah, you, know, you don't hear about those a lot. Those are things that you have to reach out to your insurance agent and ask about typically yeah, those umbrella uh, it's, policies. It's phenomenal how every 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 time we do write a plan for someone, I'm like, do you have an umbrella policy? No. I'm like, go get one. Just call mm-hmm. up your, you know, your uh, property and casualty person mm-hmm. and inquire about how much, you know, a two million or three million dollar umbrella policy would be. They're not that expensive. I mean it maybe ranges from 300 bucks a year to a thousand bucks a year, Mm -hmm. but that's pretty cheap insurance. Just to explain the umbrella policy is something that it's almost like gap insurance. It covers anything that the other insurances don't cover. Over and above, like your, like your auto and your homeowner have certain limits, right? uh, Liability. Right. Right. And then if, if you got in a car wreck, I mean, think how benign it has to be. You go out, have some wine, you're with your friends, you, you're on your way home and you get in an accident, right? Mm-hmm. And you kill, and either you hurt someone or you, you kill someone. And, you know, all of a sudden you're, you're staring down a million dollar judgment. Yeah. The $2 million judgment. And it happens. Uh, well, where are you going to get the money for that? Because uh, the creditors are coming. So that's where an umbrella coverage would kick in to cover that that expense right there. Okay. You know, got so it. I would, I would recommend anyone, the limit you can get is 5 million. That's the most you can get, okay. but I would recommend that you get at least one to 3 million dependent upon your net worth. Okay. Gotcha. Cool. So insurance would be one category. Another category, another layer of asset protection would be like putting something in like a business entity. Like, I mean, this mm-hmm. is why people have their real estate in LLCs. Yeah. because there's it's difficult for a creditor to get all of that or to make you force to force you to, to take distributions or pay them from the LLC account right so business entities are so if you have like I think anything over like two hundred fifty thousand dollars of liquid cash mm-hmm. I would probably have that in either some kind of an LLC or a limited partnership right you know yeah. just you know just yeah we've got lawyers that set up you know, 
an, your organizational chart for your family uh, they yeah. did the same for me. So our family has an LLC and our real estate is in a different LLC from our business. And exactly. each business has its own LLC so that those layers are limiting for and anyone who wants to come after them. Yeah, everything's compartmentalized. Right. So that they're all kind of in their own little entity. So you can sue this one, but that doesn't mean that you can get access to the other ones as well. Right, right. And look, how much that, uh, it took a lot of time and money to set all that stuff up. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 But it's worth it because now you don't have attention on that and right. you can go out and acquire more assets and, and those things, everything's set up. Right. It's a pain to set some of this stuff up, but you know, it, it's, it, it, <laughs> What's worse, that or just staring down the barrel of a, you know, two million dollar lawsuit? Right, right, right. Pick your poison, I guess. Exactly. For ten thousand, for ten thousand bucks or five thousand bucks, you can do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And That's true. and uh, it's you know probably less. It's painful. worth it. Yeah. yeah. So I think that would be business entities. What else could you use? I mean, their state, each state is different too. So. Like in, in a lot of states, like annuities and cash value life insurance are completely protected assets. So you right. could have any money in there is protected. Uh, and, you know, mm -hmm. certain states, your home is protected. So okay. you just, you could look at the state statutes and find okay. out which of these investments or assets would be. So just those, those are some of the tools that you have. All right, cool. And last thing we want to talk about today is how to minimize capital gains on the sale of practice. I know this isn't something that a lot of owners that are listening to are in that stage or, you know, we're not necessarily catching them right at the right time, but what can owners do as they foresee a potential say on the future to minimize their capital gains hit? Well, look, uh, this is where you have to sometimes uh, think outside the box and, uh, but you, the, the sale of your business is, is going to be one of the largest financial transactions of your life. Mm -hmm. and, and the capital gain tax on there, regardless of what happens in the next year or so, as far as it going up to 40% or whatever it's going to be, uh, it, you know, even 20, I mean, 25, 26, 28, that's still a lot, that's you a know, lot. On, a, on a $3 million sale or $5 million right. sale or a $20 million sale. It's a lot of dough. Yeah. So look, uh, there are strategies out there, but you're going to have to really consult with more of what's called tax strategists. Mm -hmm. And they can come up with, um, you know, ways that are certainly legal uh, that would help you either defer the tax, like a 1031 exchange would be a, a tax deferral strategy for real estate, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, uh, to to be able to not have to pay all of the tax up front. Now there's right. one in particular that, that we work with. It's called, um, it's called a monetized installment sale. Okay. <laughs> all right. And, and really all, all it, all it does is basically it allows you to, uh, it's a strategy using an installment note, like an installment note is something that you get, and then you're going to get a, a payment over a period a, of time. Okay. Right. And, but you combine that with a loan from a private lender okay. and uh, it, it's a, it's a strategy for you to defer your capital gain for the length of the installment note. Okay. Nice. So that would be like 30 years or so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, you would be able to get maybe 90 something percent of the, uh, of the sale, uh, you know, in, in liquidity up front. And then you'd have the ability to invest that money. You're still going to owe the tax. You're going to owe the okay, tax. So the, the amount of the tax doesn't change. If you no. owe 200,000, you're still going to pay 200,000. Yeah. Depending on what capital gains rates are when yeah. the, mm -hmm. uh, in 30 years. Okay. Sure. Yeah. But you're still going to owe the tax, but you get the time value of money. I get, I get more money to invest over a 30 year period. And it okay. just allows you. So are you better with money than the government is? <laughs> I would rather have that money. Yes. I'd rather have the money. I'll give it to them. I just want sure. to give it to them in 30 years. Right. Right. <laughs> and uh, that's fine. I mean, that's why it's not like a, a tax evasion. It's not tax evasion. It's no. just tax avoidance. Right. And then you just defer it for a 30 year period. Right. And, you know, obviously there has to be legitimate reasons why you're doing it and you need to go to a professional and, okay. you know, there's certain, there's certain things that you can do, but you can always just call me up. We have, we have relationships with, uh, with people that can do that. You know, people 
I know peeps. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You've got people. <laughs> cool, man. Well, I love the conversation today, man. Um, yeah. A lot of the stuff that I think um, I've been espousing on the podcast and into my, and also to my individual coaching clients, the fact that you could cover a lot of those bases here in this one hour is huge so i really yeah, appreciate we did it. a lot today didn't we yeah we covered a lot of ground man and if people have more questions how do they get a hold of you well they can well they can go to our website uh go to econologics uh and there's a lot of information on there uh you can download a uh, uh a book uh, for physical therapists uh called uh, financial success guide for physical therapists uh, you can take, we have plenty of financial assessments on there that measure mm -hmm. the condition of your household and your, right. and your practice as well. Cool. So we, we have a plethora of resources or you can just email me directly at eric at econologics.com. Great. So those are the, the ways you can connect. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Until the next time, I'm going on vacation for in uh, two weeks. You're going next week, right? I'm I'm gone all next week. Where are you going? I'm going to the Smokies. Nice. Yeah. Where are you going? Uh, I'm going rafting. Full okay. week of rafting trip up here in Alaska. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, nice. it'll be awesome. Some rafting, be... some fishing, going with my boys. Have a good time, brother. Thanks, man. All right, we'll, we'll talk to you later. Circle back next. Uh, uh, we'll circle back probably in July. Then, yeah. For sure. Plan on it. Okay. See you then. Talk to you later. Bye.